So this talk will be given in English. Um, so before we start, so, so okay, so Jim and I, we are teachers, uh, professors at EPITA. So how many of you know what EPITA is? Oh, this is nice. This is the good audience. Okay. How many of you actually went to EPITA for your uh, education? One. How many of you confuse EPITA and EPITEC? Okay, okay, fine. So this is a talk about uh, chasing arrows in categories containing functors and monads. And um, this is what, um, uh, I don't know if it's mid-journey or some other um, thing, thought. Um, but we had to tell it, uh, please make the cat bigger for this picture to, to appear. Um, okay, so this course, this, this, this talk is based on a course that uh, Jim and I, we designed um, at EPITA last year um, for third year students. So at the end of the third year, the students, they have to choose uh, an elective course. Um, they, they mean, comp let's say in, 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 in knowledge of, of, uh, of, uh, of computing languages and, and uh, uh, they are quite advanced, right? They know quite a lot of things already. They're not really familiar with, uh, with functional programming. Um, they are also not really familiar with category theory, um, uh, but we thought it would be fun to, to make a little course uh, which combines functional programming and category theory. Um, it's really a small thing, right? So there are, there are four modules or four lectures, if you will. Uh, uh, what are categories, types and functions, Kleistly composition and monads? Uh, and the, the, the purpose was to get to monads as fast as possible. Right? So let me also just point out that we are not here to um, try to tell you what are monads. We are here to try to tell you how to tell people what are monads. Right? So this is a, it's a meta thing. Um, it's a talk about a course, right? It's a talk about a pedagogic experience. Um, and we're, we're going to jump over the first three parts, right? We're only going to talk about monads and uh, how we, uh, we think when one can tell people what are monads. Um, so uh, I should say also that this course is heavily based on uh, a course on YouTube by um, Bartosz Milewski. I don't know if you have heard of, of Bartosz or of, or of his course. And, uh, um, he's, he's very nice. He's very thorough. It's really great material. I really recommend it. Uh, but it's also very long. So if we were to follow Bartosz in his course, we would get to monads after, um, I don't know, 20, 25 hours of video or something. And we don't have the time for this. Right? We need to be much faster. Uh, he's also got a book associated with this course. The same thing, monads is in, in, are in chapter 20 of this book. Um, we don't have time for this. Um, so we shortened what he did. Uh, and I think it was quite successful. So before we get into it, just a bit of, of presentation also. So I'm uh, Uli Fahrenberg. I've been at EPITA since 2021. Before this, uh, um, well, I did lots of other things. I have a PhD in mathematics. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a researcher. I'm interested in uh, where you see category theory, algebraic topology theory, automata theory, congruency theory, verification theory. Um, I don't know any Scala. Um, I wouldn't know it, but maybe by now I would know it if I saw it, actually. Um, so it has been a nice experience for me to be here with you. I, I thank you very much for this nice experience. So uh, Jim um, has been at EPITA a bit longer than me, six years longer, actually. Um, he's got a PhD in computer science. Um, he's been working in industry uh, for a long time using LISP and has been using Scala for some, some six years now and uh, is uh, very much interested in, in, in pedagogy and um, also, you know, in type systems, uh, in symbolic automata, uh, you know, combinations of, of theory and uh, programming practice, if I may. Okay, so this is the um, outline and um, Let's just uh, delve uh, straight into it. Uh, so there is, you know, compositions and categories, and uh, but uh, you will see what this is about. Please. Okay. So thank you, Uli, for the introduction. The first thing I want to uh, talk about is what is what is composition. So uh, composition is something that uh, a word that we throw around. Uh, 
but it, it, uh, it sneaks up in, in sort of uh, uh, subversive ways from time to time. I want to, throughout the talk, talk about two simple functions, f and g. And I'll, I'll reuse these over and over again. So f takes a double and produces an integer, and it does so by rounding. And in Scala, when you round, you get another double. So you have to call to int on that to get, to get the integer. So f takes a double and, and returns an integer, or an int. And then g takes an int and returns a string. And motivation for that is when you print out a list of strings, which are the strings one, two, three, you don't see the quotation marks. So you can't see from looking at your screen, did I get strings or integers? So you might want to decorate the, the string somehow with these square brackets. So g encodes the integer into these square brackets as, as a string. And if you notice, the, the, the head of the f arrow is the same as the tail of the g arrow. So we can compose these. We can call g on the output of f. And, or we could write a function called g after f, which calls g of f of x. And so we say these, uh, these functions are composable. And we read this symbol g after f. Um, of course, in Scala, we could write the function after, which takes g and f as parameters. And so we could define g after f as a call to after g comma f. And one thing I will say about the Scala code on the slides, a lot of it will not compile. This will be compilable only by an idealized Scala compiler. Part of that is so things will fit on the, on the slides. So as an example, f of 3.2 returns the integer 3, g of 3 returns the string with brackets around the 3, and then I can call g of f of 3.2, or I can call g after f of 3.2, or I can call directly after g comma f of 3.2, and I get the same, the same value. So uh, one note is that this notation is confusing. And even if you do this all the time, sometimes you get confused. Which comes first, F or G? Because they're written from right to left, but they're read from inside to out. Or, or um, uh, So in math, we say G, G circle F, G after F, which means G of F. Right? Um, and we're going to abuse notation and use something called map of F, which of course in Scala is a, a syntax error. But what we mean is the function that you get for mapping f across some input. And so we'll use that notation as if it makes sense. <laughs> and um, another form of composition that, unfortunately, this is on the bottom line, so people in the back can't see it, but, but x dot f open close dot g open close. So this is another way to think of composition. You're calling g on the output of f. And because of the, the Java uh, dot uh, notation, um, it's an obscure way to represent uh, uh, composition. It's very practically useful, but it, it's, it's can be, it can be confusing. OK. Um, in Scala, we have a, a type called, called option. And if we have a function from double to f, um, we can think about a function from option double to option f. And um, so the, the option is a, um, uh, right, so, 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 so the option takes these types, int, string, and double, and converts them into new types, option int, option string, and option double. And we could, uh, we could write this function f2, we could write it as uh, some type of pattern matching that if we have um, a sum x, then we call sum of x dot round dot to int. And if we have a none, which is the other possibility when you have an option, we just map that to none. Okay? So then we can create the same functions f2 and g2, um, which behave in the obvious way on option double and option int and option string. So you could write these out as, as, as hard-coded functions, and the same there for option int to string. And then these functions, g2, gf, uh, g2, f2, you can compose again with the after function that we saw on the, on the first slide. So they're just functions, and they, and they compose like functions should. 
And the same function there, rather than hard coding the, the, the code for rounding and to int, we can just call g. And so we notice that those two pieces of code are really the same, except that we've substituted f, f we've hard coded f and hard coded g into the code. Okay, so then I can call f2 of sum 3.2 and we get sum of three. Uh, G2 of sum of three, and we get sum of the string that has the bracketing around the, 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 the three. And then we can call after of G2 F3 and compose the two functions. Or in Scala, rather than writing that, um, that, that code as the, it's a pattern matching, we could just call map, x dot map F and x dot map G. And so we see that what is happening really is that F2 is somehow a map of F and that G2 is a map of G. Um, and yes, so we have the, uh, the, the option which we've used many times in the, in the Scala language. So what does this have to do with categories and what are functors? So it turns out that option is an example of a functor. But before talking about functors, we have to say, well, what is a category? So if you, if you ask uh, ChatGPT, give me a picture of a category, you might get something like this. So there's a cat named Egory. Okay, so in category theory, uh, a category or a small category is a set of, of objects, which I've labeled A, B, and C here in blue. And those objects uh, might have morphisms between them, which we represent with arrows. So there's, a, there's an arrow from A to B called F and B to C called G. And the category has some, some axioms which uh, mathematically are important, but for this discussion aren't so important, for example, Every, um, every object has an identity uh, arrow, like we have ID of B there. Uh, that's important for the definition, but not so important for the, for the Scala programmer. What is important is that, that if it's a category, then if I have uh, a morphism from A to B called F, and a morphism from B to C called G, then therefore I have a, uh, a morphism from A to C called G after F, and it is identical to the chained version of F followed by G. So in Scala, the category we're thinking of is, is the set of types, and the morphisms we're thinking of are the functions between those types. So F and G, which we talked about before, the function that, that, um, that rounds and the function that stringifies are these F and Gs. And so since we can go from double to int with f and int to g with string, then therefore we can go to, from double to string with g followed by, by f. And um, yeah, so that's just the definition of what um, composition is. So now what is a functor? So a functor in category theory is a mapping which maps objects to objects and the corresponding functions between objects to morphisms which are between the corresponding objects. So a mapping from or a morphism from double to int would get mapped to a morphism from option double to option int. And in Scala we have a, um, this, this uh, parameterized type called option which performs this, uh, this duty. Um, a functor also has a way to lift a function from the pre-image to the post-image category. So we can, we can lift f to something called lift of f, and we can lift g to something called lift of g, and in category, this lifter is called map. And the important thing about uh, such a mapping being a functor is that there are two ways to represent the mapping on the bottom line. So we could represent that as a composition of lift f and g, so lift of g uh, after lift of f, or we could equally represent the mapping as the map of g composed of f, of g after f. And, and if it's a functor, then by definition, those two expressions are equal. So the lifting of the composition is the composition of the lifting. 
Um, in reality, in the, in the image of the executable, those operations might be different. You might have different memory allocations and different operations that are occurring, but mathematically, the results are the same. So we say that those operations are, are identical. And one thing in my experience that made functors a bit difficult to understand is the notation. So the notation in the programming language is cumbersome and the notation in math is, uh, is, is elegant. And we write the, uh, the, the, um, the notation in math for elegance. So in, in Scala, when we have types and we want to map them, we use option, O-P-T-O-I-N. Is that right, O-P-T-O-I-N? Is that right? And if we have objects and we want to lift those objects, we have an integer and we want to create a, an option integer object, we don't use option, but we use a constructor called sum. So we have a disparity between the notation and, and that's a cause sometimes for confusion. And so uh, on the right-hand side, left-hand side, we have the mathematical definitions and on the right-hand side, we have the scholar definitions. So what is the important thing to gain from this this uh, slide that, um, so a, a functor, categorically speaking, is a structure preserving map between categories. So it maps objects to objects and, and morphisms to morphisms in a way that preserves the structure. In, in, uh, in Scala, a functor is a parameterized type which implements a map which preserves the composition. So that if I X map, on the bottom line, again, I apologize, it's, it's difficult to read on the, on the back row, but if I map G after F, I get the same thing as if I compose map of F with F of G. If that is true, then your parameterized type is a functor. And so we abbreviate the functor just with F. So in, in category theory, we write this single F, which encompasses all of that, the mapping of the mapping of the uh, types to types, the mapping of the morphisms to morphisms, the fact that the, the composition, uh, composition in the pre-image and the composition in the post-image are identical. Okay, a couple of examples of, of functors. So the easy example, which we see in the textbook, is of lists. So if I have a list, 1.1, 2.3, 4.5, .1, I can map F across the list, and I convert all of the doubles to integers then I can take that list and map G, and then I get a list of strings with the bracketing around the integers. But I get the exact same thing if I map once with the composition of F and G, I convert the, the doubles directly to encoded integers. So because those two last lines, if I map F then map G, or if I map the composition of F and G, return the same thing, therefore list is a functor. A slightly more interesting example is we have a tree. So we have a tree whose, whose internal nodes are just branches, in-way branches, and whose leaves are some objects of type A. So I can produce a tree of doubles with the, the code we see on the right there. Um, I can map that tree with F, map F, and I get a tree of integers. And if I map the tree of integers with G, I get a tree of encoded strings. However, I could just map the original, I could map the tree of doubles once with, with, um, with G after F, and I directly get a tree of encoded strings. Um, that might seem uh, uh, subtle, but, um, or it might seem that one is better than the other in some sense, but better is, is very contextual. If you're trying to write your code for performance, it's much more interesting to eliminate this, this wasted tree that's computed uh, as, as, uh, as temporary value. But if you're trying to optimize for debugability, you might want to walk through the tree of integers. So you might need the intermediate tree for, for debugging purposes. Um, the final results are the same, but the path of getting there, uh, computationally speaking, might be very different. Okay, so now we know what functors are. So at this point we can stretch and wake up and slap ourselves. So, this is where we should have had the second image of the cat. Oh, of the cat, yes, yeah. yes. We discussed this before. All right, so for functors, we, we know what functors are, I hope. Uh, I think some of you probably will see this definition as, as, as sophomoric, 
but, uh, but to me, the, 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 the illustrations were, were enlightening, and then I thought, well, now I finally understand, uh, understand what it is. So we want to um, know what is a monad. We know what a functor is. So if we take the two images again with F and F2, which I've written as F of F, capital F of little f, and G, and then the lifting of G, um, we might have a function that goes directly from double to option int, and a function that goes directly from int to option string. And so how can I go now from double to option string? So I could do that with F3 followed by the lifting of G, or I could do that by F and then followed by G3, but if I really want to use F3 and G3, how can I do it? So there's no path through the graph that traverses F3 and G3. They're not composable. Um, suppose uh, F3 is this function sum of, again, x dot round dot to int, and G3 is sum of S of this uh, bracketed, uh, bracketed integer. Um, how can we compose these? Um, and so as I said before, we might go F3 and then follow the lifting of G. And this would work in this case because the special way that we defined F. So F is really just sum wrapped around the implementation, or uh, F3 is just sum wrapped around the implementation of F. So this happens to work accidentally. If you plug in values, you get the right, the right results. Um, but in general, what we want is we want to somehow get from option int to int so that we can compose these, uh, these arrows. And so the notation here, rather than using a, a, um, a hollow bubble, we use a filled-in bubble, and this we call the Kleisley composition. So if we had some way to invent this, this magical function x, then we could Kleisley compose f3 with g3. And it would be g3 after x after g3. Um, we could come up with a function x that brings us from option int to int. Uh, but would that function make the diagram commute? So if we wrote the function that if we have an option int, if we have some x, we return x. If we have none, we return 0. So this is certainly a function from option int to int. But if we, um, and then if we plug in values, we find out, okay, again, it, it, it accidentally works. Why does it work? Um, it works because our implementation of F3 never returns none. So we never go through the case none maps to zero part. So it accidentally works. Um, However, if we have a more interesting implementation of F3, which we call F4 here, we change the implementation so that if we recognize if the absolute value of x as a double is larger than max int, well, we can't round it and convert it to an int anymore. So in this case, we return a none, otherwise return a sum int. And then if we call y4 on 10 times max int, we get an encoded zero rather than a none because, uh, because F4 will return uh, none, X of none will return zero, and then when we call F or G4 on zero, we get an encoded zero. So the, we can trace the graph, but it doesn't implement the, the Kleisley composition. Um, so it almost works, so it works except for this case of zero. So um, we could implement this function, flat map of G4, which if we have some int, we call G4 on the int, and we can call G4 on an int. And if we don't have some int, if we have none, we just return none. So then what we have is um, we've somehow lifted G4 over to this flat map G4, lifted in some sense. Right? We've lifted the head of the arrow, but didn't move the tail of the arrow. So in this case, the diagram commutes, so we can, we can um, implement this Kleisley composition with this flat mapped version of G4.
And of course, we don't have to hard code G4. We could write just the flat map function itself, which takes the function as a parameter. And so we could say flat map of G4 equals uh, uh, x dot flat map of, of G4. So what do I want to say there? Maybe we just want to uh, repeat the idea that uh, so so we have now introduced something called flat map, which turns G4, which was a mapping from int to option string, into flat map G4, which was a mapping from option int to option string. Right. right. So so this Kleise, Kleise composition of G4 dot F4 now uh, composes the F4 arrow with the G4 arrow by creating a new function which does the right thing. Okay? And that flat map uh, implementation is very much dependent on option itself. Okay? So the, imp the implementation of option is responsible for creating a, a flat map which makes that diagram commutable. Okay? So what is a monad? A monad is a functor with a correctly defined flat map which enforces the Kleisley composition. So F4 dot G4 is flat map of G4 composed with F4. Pressing the button, um, so yeah, okay, thank you. Um, but the question is, why flat map? What is flat about flat map? Does it have to do with map projections? Uh, I don't know. Um, um, and uh, the the answer to this question is because there is something else behind the flat map, hiding behind flat map, um, and. <laughs> To uh, expose it, we remember that option is a functor, right? So I can go from int to option end and from double to option double and from string to option string, but I can also apply it twice, right? So I'm writing f here because it's shorter than writing option all the time. So um, I, can re I can find the, the triangle well, three times. I can also find it a fourth time if I wish, but uh, it's, it's, it's in, it will be enough for us to find it thrice here. So we have the original type diagram, a double int and string. We have f of double, f of int, f of string, and then f of f of double, etc. Um, and now, um, what we can do is also to lift our function g4 once more, right? So, so remember we had um, f4 which went from double to f of int. We have, uh, we had g4, well we have g4 in the diagram which goes from int to, uh, to f of string. And now f of g4, the lift of g4, the map of g4 if you wish, goes from f of int to f of f of string. And now we can compose. Now we can compose f4 because it ends in f of int with f of g4 because it starts in f of int only the result isn't right, right? The result of the composition is a function which goes from double to option, option, string. Which is confusing because now I have uh, some, some kind of double none in my results, right? Uh, so so uh, option gets me a none and option, option gets me sums and some, well, some sums which are probably just sums and uh, some nones and non-sums and uh, non-nones and uh, what, 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 what do I do with this, right? And the answer to this is that, well, I need, I need a function which goes back. I need some, some red arrow here um, which goes from option, option string to option string. Once I have this, I can define my Kleisley composition to say, well, first I take f4, then I take the lift of g4, and then I take my mag magic function. Thank you, yes, my magic function. So here's the magic function, it's called flatten. Um, and it's something which comes with my option functor, right? So 
what does it do? It takes a sum sum and maps it to a sum. That's reasonable. It takes none and maps it to none. It seems reasonable also, but it also maps some none to none. So um, the interesting thing about this flatten function is that uh, it loses information. With the option functor, uh, we, see, we will see in a minute that it loses information. So let's just um, recall. Uh, so the answer to what is flat about flat map is the fa fact that it's the fact that it's a map composed with a flatten, right? So y4, the flat map of g4, composed or after f4 is the same as uh, first f4, then the map of g4, and then the flatten. So flat map is the same thing as flatten after map. I'm always confusing before and after, and uh, everybody is. Um, so, I mean, we can even see this in some more elaborate examples, and let me just check the time, because uh, there's also a coffee break coming up, I believe. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you apply this composed function y4 to 3.4, um, so let's say uh, if you do it in the, in the flat map way, um, you apply f4 to 3.4 and then you flat map using g4. F4 of 3.4 gets you sum 3, and then using the flat map of G4, you get sum string 3, and you get the same thing with the second computation, right? So, so uh, uh, flat map is really the same thing as flatten after map. Um, but as we've seen already uh, in, in some, some, I mean, flatten is lossy in the sense that it doesn't tell you where it's transferred into none, right? So um, the, 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 uh, the function x that uh, Jim proposed uh, some minutes ago had the, um, uh, the fault that it sometimes gave a wrong result. And uh, flattening has the fault that, uh, in this case, we don't see where things are turned into none. We don't see where the exception occurs, so to speak. Right? Um, so, but ap apart from this, so what we have now is, 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 well, it's what is called a monad, a mathematical monad, if you will. A mathematical monad comes with, uh, is a functor which comes with a sum and with a flat. Only that in mathematics, the sum is called a unit. It's denoted by nu and it's, an, uh, it's a natural transformation and uh, the flatten is also a natural transformation which is called multiplication. Uh, but that's just different words, and this word natural transformation is just uh, designed to, to scare people. Um, because all it means is that uh, things are behaving consistently when you change the input. Right? Uh, and it comes with some axioms which are quite natural actually. So, so those are here denoted using um, uh, commutative diagrams as you find them in the Wikipedia entry for uh, monad parentheses mathematics. Um, but what does the first diagram say? It says that if I start with an option, 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 well, I have uh, two different ways of, uh, of uh, double flattening it. I can flatten uh, uh, the inside first and then the outside or the other way around. Maybe it's more easy to see if my f is the list functor instead, right? So if I have a list of list of lists, then I can flatten it in two different ways. And uh, in the end, I want the same flat list. That's all, the first, what the, the, all that the first diagram is saying. What is the second diagram saying? Uh, well, it's saying that sum of none is equal to none. It's, it's precisely expressing this lossiness, right? Because my unit maps a type to some thing, it maps a thing to something, um, and then um, if I lift my unit, I map still a, a thing, things to, well, I map some things to some things and nones to some nones, and then I flatten and I get back none. Right? So this is the, the, the second diagram. Um, and we've talked about the fact that uh, flat map is the same thing as uh, flatten after map, but actually, I mean, flatten can also be just expressed using flat map. Right, so, so I was saying that flat map was, flatten was hiding behind flat map, but uh, um, flat map is also hiding behind flatten, right? Uh, it's the same thing, 
um, flatten is the flat map of the mapped uh, identity, and the flat map is flatten after map. And I believe it's your turn again. <laughs> um, the examples are, are quite uh, simple here. We already saw option, and I'm pretty sure this code uh, uh, probably doesn't compile because I didn't separate into the case of option and none. But the idea is that you have a, a, a map and a, and a flat map in the option. And then there's, you can implement, of course, uh, flatten in terms of the others or, or implement them themselves uh, in, in some, some, some flattened way. Um, List the same way, we have a, uh, a map and a flat map, which are here implemented in a very naive way, which would, would give us uh, a stack overflow for very large lists, but uh, th theoretically it's, uh, it's, it's, the, um, it's the idea. Uh, the only difference basically syntactically is the double colon changes to a triple colon for a list append rather than list, uh, list cons. Yeah, so oh, you excuse me, and, and when you showed me this code, I was amazed because, uh, I mean, the, uh, this is just very nice, right? That uh, the, the only thing which changes between the definition of map and flatten is one colon. This is very nice uh, syntax. Um, and so if you want to implement your own monad called XYZZY, uh, then you need to implement the map and the flat map. You have to implement them, of course, in a way that, that makes the diagrams commute. You could implement them any way you wanted, and it wouldn't be a monad, but if the, if the laws are, are, are fulfilled, then, then you have a monad. So, speaking of, um, of the laws which need to be fulfilled, there was a talk about Rose Tree, where the speaker was wondering why, um, why there is no flat map in, uh, in Rose Tree. Right? And uh, I think we have the answer to this now. Um, it's because there is no flatten for trees, right? If you if you imagine a tree of trees, so so you have you have nodes and uh, child relations between nodes, and then in every node you have a tree. Well, how would you define the flattening? How would you define a mapping from a tree of trees to a tree? You could do it certainly, and you could maybe also do it in a way that satisfies the axioms, etc. But there is no, let's say, natural way of doing it, right? There is a natural way of flattening a list, but a natural way of flattening a tree, I don't, I don't see it. So, so, so to me, this is the answer to the question why there is no flat map for the tree functor. Okay, yes, please. Um, so, conclusion: um, we showed you a fast introduction to categories and functors. Um, so in, in the actual EPITA setting, this translates to seven hours of lectures, two hours of exercise class, six hours of uh, Bartosz videos, um, and afterwards a workshop. So the workshop, we did it much like Jim and I we did it here, uh, in, a, in a dialogue fashion, M more dialogue than, than we, could, uh, we could do here, right? Exactly, yes. <laughs> And uh, I just want to point out that uh, uh, this is not a typo, right? When Jim saw the slide, in order to be able to talk about Scala, monads, and monads, he thought I wanted to say something else. But uh, Wikipedia has two, two uh, things about monads, right? There is monads category theory, and there is monads functional programming. And this is just bollocks, because it's the same thing. Um, there, there, there is just no difference, but it, it took us too a long time to, to understand this, right? And to understand that uh, Jim, he thinks about flat map when he thinks about monads, and I think about flatten. And uh, it's two different things, and I call them natural transformation, and he calls them uh, parameterized types, and it's just the same thing. Um, there's also lots of things that we didn't talk about in the lecture, so, so uh, I should give credit where credit is due because Bartosz's course is much longer, right? And uh, we had talks today about category theory things, uh, yesterday also, um, which are also in Bartosz's course, which are also in the book Algebraic Data Types, for example. Um, so this is why, I mean, uh, if, I, mean, uh, I guess you could do the course that Bartosz is giving, but you would need other students because as a Peter, they are, they are less patient uh, than this. Um, I think this is it. You have something to add, Jim? No, thank you.
We have any questions? Yeah, well, um, thank you for, for the talk. And um, is the material available? Because, um, uh, well, to, to tell a story, um, uh, we've, I, I have a, a, a team where uh, we had lots of people that change in the team. And, and well, in that situation, you, you might have at some point a group of people that speak with the category theory uh, vocabulary, but then people change and, well, you, you can't use it anymore because you have to run them up first. Uh, otherwise, you might create cr frustration on them and so on. And so, Bartosz content is, a, is, is great, but uh, it takes time to consume. And, and therefore, m maybe what you built can be very useful to me because uh, it, it can help me, uh, like, get the team ramp up on, on this vocabulary faster. So, so uh, to answer your question, um, so the, the slides are um, a high level synopsis of an accompanying document, which uh, explains with, with many more details. That document uh, is not finished, but, but Uli already said we should make that document publishable somehow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so. so because the course itself is just on, on the on the Epita Moodle, right? Uh, as usual, now nowadays everything is on Moodle, so nobody can access it, and uh, uh, eventually it gets lost, right? Uh, um, maybe we could copy the course, right? But uh, uh, we have this document uh, diagrams.tech, uh, which is now 30 pages, um, which I think may uh, may be helpful. Yeah. So one one thing that makes you understand something is is being able to explain it, mm. right? So I. I, I heard a lot of explanations of, of monads, and I never understood it until I had to actually explain it to somebody else. So, and actually, I, I never saw a definition of monad that said, a monad is an X that does Y. I never saw this definition anywhere. I saw it, monad is like this, it's like this, it's a, this is an example of it, it's, it's la, la, blah, 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 but I never saw a monad is an X that has attribute Y. Monoid in the category of end Well, you have that right? one, but it's not useful. Right? <laughs> so, uh, a monoid is a functor which implements a flat map which makes a particular diagram commute. That's, in my mind, then it makes sense. Oh, and speaking of Bartosz, of course people are allowed to watch his video with uh, double speed, right? Because he is also rather <laughs> slow sometimes. Yeah. We have another, another question over here. Thank you for this explanation of monads. Uh, is there something similar for traverse? Because uh, usually I have um, much more difficulty explaining what, what it is to someone. It's a lot more complicated tra to explain what traverse does compared to flat map. Now, I realize I don't know to, to explain it like you said. It's something which does X. I, yes. I can no, say I don't, it's uh, some, actually, I can I don't say know what traverse is. So. Like it, it's you, you can, yeah, that's. I just can't explain it correctly. So. <laughs> I, I, would, I would, though, I so. would like a definition of, of a um, uh, type class. Because I've never seen a definition of a type class which gives me an idea of what it is. I've always heard it's like this, it's like this, here's its syntax. And then I try to create one and somebody says, no, that's not type class, you've missed the point. <laughs> Yeah, but, but uh, no, Traverse, uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's an F of G, which can be invested into a G of F. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we are F and G are two categories, yes. But Is I it something know. about per, uh, commutativity? Yeah. yeah, you know, it's something like you have two categories, F and G, and you can uh, turn, it, turn them inside out. So you Is it a commutable, a permutable uh, so functor? Uh, because I was, we were discussing the other day, because there are cases where it came up with permutable functors, and I said, what is, uh, yeah, what is, so, what is the thing so here? Like, so like if you have a, a list of options, you can turn it into, into an option of list, which is defined uh -huh. if all the options inside the list are defined and none of the rise. So you, you, ta you take your list of options and turn it into an option of list, and it works fine. I, I had the case recently that I had a, uh, I, was, I was computing uh, polynomials with matrix coefficients. And when you get to the end, it's the same as if you commute, if you uh, um, compute the matrix with polynomial entries. 
So like uh, a matrix of polynomial of integer is the same as it, well, I don't know which one I just said, but uh, mm -hmm. polynomial be matrix of integer. <laughs> <laughs> these, these, mm -hmm. these functors in this case happen to commute, but of course in other cases they don't. This is called the distributive law of monads. Right? And sometimes oh, no. monads distribute and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. Does Bartos explain all of this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Bartos explains distributive laws of monads because that's a, that's a rather new uh, thing. Um, with the most interesting result being that the power set uh, monad does not distribute over itself. <laughs> well, okay, but uh, I digress. Uh, but maybe we can talk more about this during the break. Yeah, sure. If you have it. So thank you all for your attention. I know it's a long day, but <laughs> thank you.